And today we have Renee Schaefer here with um, Community Food Response. So I'll pass around the clipboard for everybody to sign in. We'll go ahead and welcome Renee. Good morning. Um, so Oli and Lena were walking through the woods, just a little stroll, and they happened upon a wishing well. And they stood and gazed at it for a moment, and Lena looked in to take a better look and promptly fell in. Oli scratched his head and said, Matt, I didn't think those things really worked. <laughs> um, I had an opportunity to speak um, uh, regarding the, the Community Food Response Hunger Agency that's located here in Rochester um, at the Synod Assembly back in May. And I partnered with Channel One and we talked about clean and what kinds of things that entail, what that entails. Channel One does that on a, on a very large scale. Um, and Community Food Response has kind of a specific niche that um, they cover. I was employed with them up until the end of August, and it's a very amicable uh, re ending of our, of our thing. I have their full blessing to be here and to speak at every ELC congregation in Rochester if I'm so moved or I'm invited. So um, I just wanted you to know that um, Community Food Response has been around since 1993. Last year, um, I celebrated the 20-year anniversary. And the mission of uh, Community Food Response is to help mitigate hunger in Rochester and surrounding communities. It's not really limited to just Rochester. Um, purpose to rescue good food that may end up in landfills and provide help to individuals who may or may not qualify for other means of food support. And that includes individuals. There are no qualifications for this program. You nearly, you simply need to be a hungry person in Rochester or the surrounding community. So this opens up um, opportunities for folks who just may be at the end of the month and the end of the paycheck and nothing in the refrigerator that they can still feed their family and pay the, um, the utility bills, which if they don't, I believe, would render them homeless. It's my understanding that's one of the criteria for rentals. Or, anyway. So that's, um, an, and, and there are several people like that, but there are no qualifications. It's a nonprofit. Charter nonprofit and certified by the federal government, so contributions are tax deductible. And they're located in the basement of Bethel Lutheran Church. Has anyone here served at Community Food Response? Paul. Oh. That's a conscripted volunteer serving. <laughs> um, there are several members of Mount Olive who have or and currently do serve in a couple of different ways with community food response. We have a family that does some volunteer driving and a couple of other individuals who serve at the distribution in the evenings or come if I if I bag them. Some of my circle members. <laughs> um, so it's a <clears throat> supported by volunteer drivers who collect food. So you use your own vehicle you go to Bethel and you pick up picnic coolers. This gives you a means by which you can transport food safely. Um, inside the picnic coolers included a couple of um, block ice things to help keep the food cold. Collect foods from restaurants such as Canadian Honker, Chester's, um, cafeterias like Harwick, the Mayo Clinic campus, schools, and grocery stores. And they, they have a set route and they pack up all that food that oftentimes the facilities pack them up, like hiding things would be already in boxes, and then you bring the food to Bethel. The whole rest of the operation 
is led by volunteers. So the food comes to community food response, they sort it out based on category, such as entree, you know, protein, vegetables, fruits, starches, and um, desserts that has their own category, and dairy as well. Um, not a lot of dairy is donated, but um, there is a, a local restaurant here, Perkins, who specifically orders extra uh, dairy just to donate. So that's very helpful. Community Food Response CFR is open every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 5 to 6.30. That's the actual opening hours. So uh, the food recipients start coming in the winter. Sometimes they're very early because a lot of the recipients take the bus. Take the bus. And whenever the bus can drive them off right outside Bethel, and then they kind of just stay inside the stairwell there. Um, Bethel had an old kitchen before they did their remodel, and the Community Food Response is has been located there since its inception, and now it's the only um, inhabitant to share the space with the Bethel quilters who come once a week. Um, so the major holidays, they're closed. You can stop me and ask questions anytime. Uh, adults and families with children in need are served, and they currently provide food to approximately 100 families um, each Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And some of those are the same individuals. Some come each Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Um, it ends up being between 200 and 300 people that are served each evening. Um, they are So what do they accept? Because there is, it's a kitchen, but you know there's no stove or anything like that, and the food needs to be handled very safely. Um, they accept pre-cooked and packaged food, so it's usually all pre-packaged before it's picked up. And there's a very um, limited amount of food that needs to be divided up or anything, but it also has to be pre-cooked. -pre we're mindful of the population that we serve and the limitations they may have in reheating uh, the food. And they can't indicate to us if they need uh, plastic ware or if they need something that should that they just can't reheat and they need to eat it as is. So the food recipients, that information is gathered and, and they can indicate that to the dist distribution team. Um, fresh vegetables and fruit, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but this is always a, a huge need, um, fresh vegetables and fruit. Um, and also, well, we also get bread and then, like I mentioned, milk. So this is what some of the food looks like. I think on the left, that food came from Trader Joe's, and that's an example of some of the produce that is given. It is important to mention that some of the produce is not in its happiest state by the time it arrives at community food response. That's just us, you know, what happens with produce, especially avocados and things. But none of it is ever left behind on any distribution unit. On the right is an example of some of the food that comes from the Harvard Care Cafeteria. Any of you who might work over there may have seen some of this before. So pre-packaged, which is nice. And um, I think that's sandwiches and cake. Toss salad, and that's a sandwich and then a dessert to eat. And milk. That's an example of what might be put into a, a bag of food for the, the recipient. So what really goes into a food rescue agency? What what is a food, you know? Is that a little gross to people? That's why we emphasize the fact that it's pre-packaged and it's packaged safely by the um, facility who's donating it. These are what are, I think are the key elements of a food rescue agency. Number one, and um, I have, I've been invited to speak about this in one of the um, ELCA churches in Zumbro. 
with the thought of them starting their own agency in that area to serve that area. So I put this kind of together to say, what, what goes into this? So you need to be really cognizant of food safety. Um, you need a strong core uh, group of volunteers. There's one of the volunteers over there that just joined us. Thank you, Mary. Um, you need your donors. Um, food donors is what I'm you know, really talking about. Recipients and how do you um, let people in the community know that this is available. You have to have proper funding in order to run an agency like this um, and to pay any staff. And uh, of course, you need a mission. Uh, I, I believe that first of all, you have to find out what the need is before you build your mission. Can't say would it be a good idea to hand out, you know, pencils at such and such. I mean, you really should look to the need. What is it that people are are looking for? So food safety, um, CFR operates. Yes, Paul. I'm just going to mention that you might want to, on that previous slide, you may want to say location for for your distribution. You may want to include that. Yeah, I think that's, that's a, a very good point. Um, there are some limitations with the current location because it's located in the basement at Bethel. This, this can be um, a barrier to people receiving the food. I, I know that through some of the strategic planning that's been going on that um, another location may be um, an option to where it can be distributed to somewhere that's still on the bus route but a little more um, amenable, not to move from Bethel. That's not the, the point, but just to, to get food out to people uh, in another way. We do sometimes have people that come and pick up food for others. We also partnered with um, the Rochester Outreach Center, which is located in Southeast Rochester. They um, have food distribution there um, frequently. They use some of this prepared food to take to their not necessarily members, but their community of people that are homebound and seniors in particular. So they are using the part of the resources of community food response to reach out into the community to where the need actually is. And also handicap access as well. Right, and handicap access, uh, Bethel does have a limited, there is a, a, an elevator where people can come down. They have to come through a different way, and they can't actually get into the distribution location, unfortunately. But people, they wait at the door, and people fill up their bag and send them the, the bat. So it's a workaround. Um, but you know, the the thing is, is that community food response resides free of charge at the Bethel location, and that's huge to an agency. Um, so they're able to utilize the funds for the best possible purposes. Um, I should have brought a container, but you know, we do provide the containers to the donors, so that is an expense to the organization. So food safety training is provided, and that's partly why um, we did a little shift in the employment piece. The, there is now a staff person that's 100% at the site during the open hours. Um, many of you who know me well know that I'm probably the kind of person who likes to tell people what to do instead of actually doing it myself. So, <laughs> not really. But, oh, thank you all. So I've provided some of these um, same containers to Nancy. Um, so we're exempt from the, the real food safety licensure that Oster County provides. We work closely with the Oster County Health Department, and they've indicated to us that we are safe under Bethel. Um, as, and it's the same non-licensure agreement that Mount Olive has. We don't have to have that. So there's key positions within the volunteer organization. Um, there are people who lead it and in, in the daytime and in the evening. And so they're kind of the, the key uh, personnel there. 
and we've been blessed with very motivated and passionate individuals who care very much about the hungry um, in the community and um, volunteer their time typically just once per month. So it's not a huge uh, time commitment. The organizations that are part of community food response, such as Bethel, um, specifically the ELCA congregations are Bethel, Gloria Day, um, Sumbro, and we have volunteers so from the other um, ELCA congregations. Rotary's part of it, um, the Kiwanas, other faith organizations as well. So there, there's about 20 or 22 organizations um, that support community food response with volunteers. They have a unique volunteer structure. So each organization has what they call an organizational liaison. That person is responsible for the recruitments of the recruitment of the individuals who serve on any given day and they're assigned or have chosen a specific day of the month, so first Monday, fourth Friday, something like that, and they stay with that day. So the volunteers know which day they're going to be needed. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the organizational support. Um, it's properly licensed drivers, I mean, and you, there's no really, there's no reimbursement or insurance sort of thing, but um, it hasn't seemed to be needed. And it's, uh, there's a volunteer board of directors as well. Currently, Beth Pasta um, is the president of the CFR board. And we have a lot of, there are a lot of male folks who are also on that board of directors. So what did, what we, how, how do we support the food donors? Um, so we provide these containers to them. Some of them don't need them, but it's just a two-piece disposable container. I think it's a one quart, about four servings. And the restaurants and those places that do um, package up their leftovers use these <coughs> containers, and all of that packaging is done at their location. And like I said before, when we pick it up, they've kept it refrigerated. We get a huge amount of food from Hunker Catering. Huge. And in fact, Paul's daughter Stacy just got married, and when they, they had Canadian Hunker Catering, they indicated to them that you know they don't leave any leftovers behind, and, and that all of the food that's left over that their guests haven't eaten goes to community food response. It's part of the um, informational package that's provided at the time they book their service. So, um, anyway, so we get wonderful food from them, wonderful entrees and, and things like that. Um, each organization, okay, thank They have a scheduled day that they are picked up. Some ask to be picked up every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So that makes, that's what constitutes a driving route. So it's a set route, and the drivers know where they're going. Many of them have done this for 15 years, and um, so they're, they're used to it, and they have their own ways of kind of getting that um, done between them. The recipients are, um, we're part of the 211 network. Does everyone know about 211? It's a helpline. Um, you can call from any landline, and now most um, cell services do support 211. If you're in need of anything um, and need some help, they will connect you with the agencies in your area that can provide that kind of information. Um, and this is supported and funded through United Way Olmstead County. Well, not just Olmstead County, but all of the United Way in, um, in the state. So other agencies refer people to us. Um, 
homesick on his staff. Um, we go to appear at a lot of community events. I was at one at the library this summer. Um, so any opportunities we have to be part of the community events that are helping people connect to services that they may need, we try to, to be there as well. And then when other agencies need us to um, give out information about their services that may benefit our food recipients, then we are happy to do that as well. Specifically, um, United Way does a free tax preparation program. People may not know that, but they do the tax preparation through and in partnership with the AARP. So not just for the seniors, but for those who may need that help um, and not pay a, a, someone to do that. Cut sometimes up to two hundred dollars. So that I think I mean, United Way website might have that information, but. They kind of track how much the people get back, and it's a significant amount of money that goes back into their own pockets. Funding, this is what you might expect from an agency. You know, you look at where is grant money available, um, volunteers, volunteer donations from the volunteer structure, organization support, so those organizations don't just support the them with volunteers, but very often they're in their budget. Um, individual fundraising, we were the beneficiaries of uh, male radiology takes one agency each year and does specific focused fundraising for that agency. And through that, um, Community Food Response was able to get a new floor, the kitchen floor was probably original to the 1950s building. Um, so they were able to put down a very, very durable service um, to help with the cleanliness and so far as well, as well. But they did a lot of fundraising as well. And then community individuals, people are very passionate about helping to feed hungry people and like the work that this agency does. So for submission needs to be defined um, and a strategy to support it, uh, some of those things that I previously mentioned. I really feel strongly about the use of measurement tools. I don't think that you can really say how, you've, how you're doing if you don't know how you did. Um, and some of the things that are measured, yes, Oh, I'm sorry. When you remember the slide, I think like that's the question. Okay. So the tracking is done on the number of recipients that are served and the pounds of food that are donated and how many volunteer hours are recorded. Um, we send out a letter to each of the donors at the end of the year saying you donated X number of pounds of food. Um, and this served, you know, we serve, I, there's something around 90,000 people that are served each year. And it's hard to exactly quantify because it always depends upon the amount of food that is received that day. Um, and that's somewhere in the neighborhood of, well, I'm just gonna get to some statistics there. What would you like to? Yeah, with regard to the mission, um, as Destination Medical Center idea starts to happen, if it, if it does happen, um, the idea of one of the implications of that is that there will be a lot of jobs coming in the city of Rochester. I think a lot of those jobs are going to be service type jobs, taking care of hotel rooms and stuff like that. And that's going to change to some extent the population. It's going to bring a lot of families who are lower income families who are the most likely to need this kind of a service. So how much discussion is there going on about what this is, what the, the community is going to look like in five years and ten years, what the timeline for that is, where in town those people are most likely to be located, so sort of places where these things would have to happen. Uh, how much discussion is going on in the community about that? I only know about what I've read in the paper specifically. I can tell you a little bit about what happened here. Yes, ma'am? Uh, the some of the speakers from the uh, council was here last week, and one of the questions was about housing for these people. Mm -hmm. I do know this 
firsthand as we've just spent three months trying to find a place for my daughter and her children to live. It took three months to find a place that they could afford. The criteria too, there's a whole rental criteria thing here and it's it's scary. I'm not sure that I could rent. <laughs> as, we, as we speak to the leaders of the community, this is something we have to be saying to them. They're putting a lot of effort into what are the business needs and all of those kinds of things. They're not putting any effort, or it doesn't seem like they're putting as much effort into what are the needs of the people that they need in terms of housing and food and those kinds of things. And that's something that the church should be speaking to. I agree. Yes. Um, Renee, one of the things that we're talking about doing at an upcoming forum um, is actually hosting a DMC toolkit. Um, which, if you're not familiar, the Destination Medical Center team is in the process of asking for feedback from individuals, from organizations, and they're asking people to host gatherings, parties, gatherings, whatever you want to call them, and walk through the series of questions and provide feedback on what things should be happening along with this you know, development of facilities and infrastructure, what other things need to happen. So I would respectfully suggest that maybe as a congregation, having seen some of these other existing issues, having concerns about how that's going to perhaps be exacerbated or changed with the future development, that maybe that would be one way that we could at least start to provide a voice for these folks who you know, aren't maybe in a position to be filling out their own toolkit or to be making demands or we're just so busy trying to survive right now that, that you know, that they are just using the services of what they can. So that's, you know, just toss that out there. Thank you, Joe. Does anyone else have any other information that would be helpful? I, I agree with this, and this is one of the things, and we'll talk about this at the end. There's a larger agency called Hunger Free Minnesota that's located in St. Paul, who is doing some of that same capacity building work. Yes. Just one more comment about your last point about measurement tools. I, I get the uh, newsletter every year from the Gates Foundation, and the Bill Gates Foundation has been incredibly effective around the world in helping the third world countries and helping the poor. And he would argue that measurement tools have been the most important part of that whole uh, endeavor. If you can't say to people, you can't just say to people, we're helping the poor. You have to say, 5% of the population came out of poverty last year because of us, and 3% the year before that. You have to be able to present the numbers in order to convince people and get them excited about what you're doing. And so I really agree with, with that last point. You have to come up with good measurement tools for what you're doing. Right. And we made a lot of progress over the last, the community food expense has made a lot of progress over the last year or so because of some efforts from, with some funding that we were granted by Hunger Free Minnesota. And this is essential. I mean, they did some of this before, but it's really been eye-opening to take a real good look at what is the need in Minnesota <coughs> and specifically in Southeast Minnesota. They provided us with some very detailed um, statistical things of 10 million meals missed every, every year in Minnesota. 10 million. It's like one out of every two. And of course more for those who, I don't know when the last time I missed a meal, um, unless it was on purpose. You know, and I grew up in a family of great hospitality, as probably many of you Midwesterners are really, I mean every culture has their hospitality. And so I didn't, I've never really known hunger. Um, so, but it's definitely there. So what does community food response need from our blueprint? Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm just give the statistics piece. So there's approximately 20 volunteers every day, and that's two to three hours each. 20,000 pounds of food distributed per month. Um, about three meals given per visit, and you could argue that it's more than that, probably. Um, 89,000 plus meals distributed in 2013. And just, I guess the cooler isn't a statistic, but it's a huge, huge thing. Um, 
through some grant funding from Rochester Area Foundation and another agency, I don't recall, another foundation, I don't recall, um, Community Food Response has granted enough funds to install a walk-in cooler. Um, and this is the first step on a capacity build, on capacity building efforts. So it's a really, really big deal not to be able to store and get, you know, be able to actually get more food in. Having said that, there is no more food we're getting if we don't, if there's not enough volunteer drivers to go pick it up. Um, so these are the ongoing needs of the agency for volunteer drivers, for somebody who would uh, like to be a lead uh, as a day coordinator, um, opener support, that person helps with some of the heavy lifting for that particular um, job. There's a huge need for fresh produce and dairy, and additional organization support, which is this Farm is the first step for us to really take a closer look at um, becoming an organization. Uh, it takes more. I have to would have to present that to the council and so on. But just to find out if there's if there's interest here to really looking at how we can support this organization that's already doing work that um, our synod is very very interested in. Very interested. Um, so what does that actually mean? So I just threw in here for your um, edification that what happens, what does a day coordinator opener actually do? Um, and it's it's a lot. They have a lot of job. Yes, ma'am. I was wondering, um, when you're talking about extra food, I'm not talking about just one or two food pepper for something that we have a large drive and we have a lot of surplus. Yeah. yeah, and we'll talk a little bit more about that here at the, at the end, what other kinds of things that could be, that could happen, um, even our own community garden here. So the, the opener does have a fair amount of responsibilities. Um, we're lucky to have really committed people who work well, you know, and the, the staff personnel who's on site really isn't, um, doesn't, well, I trained her a little bit, just don't get in the way of the volunteers, they know what they're doing. <laughs> Let them do their thing, they, they always have really good ideas and things to, to uh, improve. Um, opener support really just helps them, there's a lot of food that comes in fast and furious, there's a very cool trolley that they can set the coolers on at the top of those steps and roll it down so nobody has to carry that heavy stuff down, but it, it does get to be a little bit heavy, 30 some pounds. Um, but the drivers come probably around 1 o'clock and they are probably done by 3, 3.30. And like I said, they have a set route. Um, typically, some of the drivers can do this all in one trip, um, even with my little wagon I always have to two trips to get to pick up the food. Um, the food sorters um, handle the food safely. They're trained and there's postings and how to do that. Um, oftentimes there is food that needs to be repackaged. We might get a package this big full of bagels. Harvick is wonderful at donating soup to us, but they, they make it themselves and package it in must be two gallons containers, and so we have to be able to s divide that into you know something manageable for a family. Um, this is the most fun, and a lot of youth groups like to come and do this. The food distribution, and it's actually working at the site. Um, the food recipients check in. Um, the can, uh, Community Food Response uses the Community Information Sharing System, which is a channel, channel one trick. It's a United Way supported information system funded by IBM and overseen by United Way. And it's free to channel one and to the other agencies who want to use it. It provides some statistical information to the community 
specifically in Rochester about hunger. Um, so you get an identification card, and that's your only thing that you need, and you, they just scan that card when they come to get food. Um, and any kind of instructions about allergen, allergies, and things like that are included in that information that pops up when the recipient's card is scanned. Um, and then, of course, it tells how many people in the family and so on. And oftentimes, there's such a limit on the amount of dairy that comes in that they can only get um, dairy for the children. Yes? Is there a minimum age to a volunteer? Um, I like to say 16. Um, you can come as a family, however. They encourage family volunteering. So uh, uh, I've taken my grandkids, and uh, I've taken my, my granddaughter, who's only six, um, but she kind of gets a special job sitting on a stool, not in the traffic pen. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a good way to get little kids involved in being charitable and seeing some of the needs. I have heard, too, that there are there is a shortage of family volunteering opportunities in the community, so this is um, one place where once a month you and your family could. And we have a family at Monroe who drives once a month, and the whole family gets into the to the mode there, and they go pick up all the food. And it's just wonderful to see them all come then with helping, and kind of miss that since. So the closers are typically, it's kind of a, a special job because we do use the community information tracking or sharing system and they have to be specially trained on it and there's a confidentiality piece and so forth. So they, at this point, have limited it to past board members and um, current board members. So this is a working board. This is not people who meet once a month. They actually volunteer once or twice a month as well, so they're really hands-on. Um, they're also responsible for a lot of the grant writing and things like that. I mean, they have to be. Um, so if there is an interest, if you have a passion for um, helping people in this capacity and, you know, would like to serve on a board, please, um, I'll give you that information. So if I can get that um, link to the So Hunger Free Minnesota is just one of the many agencies in the state of Minnesota who have, um, are, are helping with um, hunger issues. And last, I think you have to write a book and make a choice to open the Hunger Free. On it. I'll just go on it. It's not to... Uh... So, um, 2012, 2013, um, Community Food Response wrote a grant. There's an opportunity for agencies such as Community Food Response to really um, to get some funding to help them with a couple of things. One was capacity building, and there was a $50,000 grant to those who were, as you say, shovel ready and could actually impact the, the number of meals that were being served. Community food response is really not at that level, and so we no, were granted five thousand dollars to do capacity planning. Um, that's okay. So um, that really led. This is a grassroots organization that was built from um, a need that was seen, and for really to not have to. Um, throw away all that food they were seeing at the end of the day at their restaurants. So that um, led to the creation of this. And there was a time when they didn't give up food every single day. Thank you. So I might have to um, just scroll down here, Joe. I think this is just talking about what they did. They invested this much money so far and have added 92 million meals.
from the impact of the projects that they funded. This is tremendous. It's a tremendous um, impact. And community groups, this is all over the state of Minnesota. There aren't a lot of agencies in Minnesota that do what community food response does, the actual food rescue piece. So this is kind of a, a, a unique um, kind of a thing, but it's a very simple thing. Drive around to the restaurants and get their schools and get their leftover food and bring it and pass it up to people who need it. And they just take it home. There's no place to actually sit there and eat. Can you just scroll down and the list? So these are some of the funders, Cargill, General Mills, Hormel, Midwest Dairy. These are just some of the agencies that have, that have benefited from the um, so there's another prepared food rescue. One of the interesting things I found when I was looking at this was that they are doing um, food rescue at the college level, so they're actually having um, student involvement with you know packaging up that food and making sure that it goes where it's needed. I believe in Southeast Minnesota, um, Channel One got some of the funding and um, community food response. So there's lots of interesting things going on and other foundations and agencies and so on are really interested in this kind of work. Um, down here somewhere. Keep looking. There's another one in the church. Oh, there we are. So we had $5,000. Um, so, we looked, so the, it was a very interesting work that we were able to do with that and brought in experts in helping to write strategies. And as a result of that, it became evident um, to me and to others that we really needed a, someone on site full time. And um, that's just not uh, a strong suit for me. So, um, I, so they, I helped them write a job description to get someone on site who can really help with that food safety piece, uh, make sure volunteer shortages are filled, and you know, every time you know, I worked from home most of the time, because so I wasn't at the site quite as much. I mean, a lot, but this I think is a good. And then that just takes us to our last slide. So Carrie Dunn is the individual who is responsible at Community Food Response. She does volunteer coordination, site management. Um, she used to be with the farmer's market. So she has a lot of um, connections with that sort of thing. Um, before I finish, I'm just going to pass around this sheet. If this is of interest to you, to volunteer with Community Food Response weekly or monthly. Currently they have a shortage of people specifically during the day on the second Monday of the month for sorting. And that's been an ongoing need. Um, Mayo Radiology was with us, you know, for a year and now they aren't. So left a big gap in that particular um, area. There's always a need for volunteer drivers. If that is of interest, I'll just pass this around. Um, the other thing is... Oh. Carrie's not full-time. No, she works Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Um, about 15 hours a week. What time do you get done? Sorry, they usually start around 1.30 or 2, and they're done by 4 or 4.30. Another thing, um, we talked just a, a little bit about um, donating your own produce. Because community food response is open Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, the food recipients do get fresh produce a little bit more regularly than they do at Channel 1 because of the fact they can only go there once a month. So this is, um, I think, a huge opportunity for um, communities such as Mount Olive or others any other organization you might be affiliated with to really look at that aspect of community gardening. I grow a big vegetable well fairly food for us, and so I donate a fair amount of that produce to CFR. My neighbor was growing cucumbers, and so we, um, he 
they before we picked them and tomato plants that I gave them. And, and so you might have a neighbor like that too. They're never going to use all that produce. But every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday between the hours of 1 o'clock and say 4 or 4.30, you can bring your fresh produce there and um, donate it. Last year I donated 500 pounds just from my garden, and this year probably won't the same bit. I mean, that's some big key numbers, I realize that. But, um, you it's for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it feels good. It feels, it feels good to be able to do that. Um, and just just for your information, not to be bragging about it, but I am an Homestead like County Master Gardener, so I can help anyone who might be interested in starting a small garden patch or anything like that. Um, I've had the pleasure, privilege of working with um, Friendship Place this summer and building their community garden. So we've got some of those kids, some fresh produce um, into their hands too as well. So, um, I would be happy to take any questions, but otherwise you're free to come on. Thank you very much. I'll pass this around or you can just